right. Good morning. Lower this down a little bit. We are in the book of Philippians. We're at chapter 2, so I'm going to read from the Pew Bible that you have there. If you want to bring it out and follow along with me, it'll be a little bit different than the NIV translation on the screen. We're at chapter 2. And as is always the case, it's only by the grace of God's Spirit that we can hear God's voice speaking to us through these stories, these poems, these letters. So let's pray before we open the scripture. Oh God, we thank you for your grace, which speaks to us through these ancient words. Lord, we pray now that you would help us to hear whatever it is that you want us to hear. Lord, you know what it is that we bring to you, what it is that we're bringing into this day, what maybe we're carrying that feels heavy. And so, Lord, would you speak words of encouragement, hope, maybe direction, redirection. Lord, whatever it is that you want to say to us now through the scripture, help us hear. For we pray it in Jesus' name. And we all say together, amen. amen. All right. The Apostle Paul writes, If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Well, we are making our way through the book of Philippians. Just a little background. Of course, the, the letter was written by the Apostle Paul to a particular church in a region called Philippi. Hence, the name of the book is Philippians. If Paul was writing to us here in Moorpark, the book would be called more Parkians, right. And as Pastor Mike has been teaching us, Paul loved this church. He had a special affection for them, more so than the other churches. And we know that because all over the book, we see um, evidence with the way that he writes of his um, great love and devotion to them. Some have said this is maybe even his favorite church of all the churches that he planted. Paul wrote this letter from prison, probably somewhere in Rome, and he wrote to give encouragement and spiritual guidance to the community here. Now, one of the things we learned from the contents of the letter is that this church had some troubles. They were dealing with conflict within. There was some sort of family church tension First and only time there was ever conflict in the church. <laughs> Probably not. No, we know that's not the case. Because whenever humans gather, there tends sometimes to be conflict. They had tr troubles, tension within, but they also had some stuff going on outside their community. They were dealing with some sort of harassment by their pagan neighbors. We don't know a lot about this, but we know that um, it happened because Paul addresses this in his letter. So he begins by speaking to them like a good parent. He doesn't scold them, shame them. He doesn't tell them that they've failed in their witness for Christ. 
Not at all. He begins here in this first verse by reminding them of who they are in Christ. He's speaking to their identity, reminding them of who they are. It's always the case that how we live our lives, the choices that we make, things that we choose to do or not do, say or not say, it comes from how we think about ourselves, which is now it's widely known in this generation that if you tell a child that they are bad, you can expect bad behavior, but if you tell them that they're good, there's much uh, it's a much greater likelihood that you will have good behavior. You name their identity for them, and then they live into that. Well, the Bible proclaims um, that we are good. In the very first chapter of Genesis, God made humanity and said, not just that we are good, but that it is very good. What God has made is very good. And so Paul's teaching here in Philippians at the other end of the Bible is a continuation of this divine proclamation about us. And um, so notice here how he addresses them in a very loving way, mirroring the way that God is with us. Verse 1, if you have any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, if any fellowship in the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion... And you can almost hear him say, and you do, which is a very creative way of um, telling them who they are. We remember that Paul was a master with words, and specifically with the art of writing a letter. Many people were in his day. Remember, Paul was from the first century Greco-Roman world, which was long before the dawn of computers, even typewriters. And in that time, they really, really valued uh, the art of writing a good letter. So everyone was taught who was in school to write a good letter. You would have had something like math, science, language arts, and letter writing, or something like that. It was that important. It was taught to everyone how to write a good letter. So here Paul poetically and persuasively reminds the Philippians who they are. They are a people united with Christ. And in Christ, God gives them encouragement, strength, hope, comfort, all that is needed for life. Now I'm going to pause here for a moment, here at verse 1, because... The truth is that while we may believe this to be true for our own lives, that in Christ God gives us all that we need for life, we can believe that in our heads but not always feel that in our hearts. The Psalms powerfully remind us that this feeling is just part of the human condition. We all experience this at times. And the Psalms are the ancient prayer book uh, some 150 of them, 150 prayers, 70% are psalms of lament. The psalmist pouring out their, their grief, their agony, their heartbreak to God. And um, the reason I highlight this is because it's a great model for us. And as the psalmists pour out their, their complaint to God, they go back and forth many times between complaint and trust. Complaining to God, putting their trust in God. And it's a great reminder for us that this is how we also are called to pray, to tell God like it really is, because God already knows the truth anyways. No fluff, no glossing over what is true, what is hard, what is difficult. Well, back to Paul. So here he reminds them of who they are in Christ, what they have in Christ, whether or not they are feeling it or not. This is what they have in Christ. And then he says to this church that's having some conflict, because this is who you are, then live this way, which is the next few verses. He says, be united with one another. Have one mind. Don't be selfish. Consider others better than yourselves. And then the last section of this chapter, or this section, is an ancient hymn, which is also a confession of faith, of who Christ is. 
One of the commentators I read said, in Paul's mind, the church, the church doesn't need a scolding, but a reminder of the event that created and defined their life together which is the Christ event. The church has always gathered around Christ to receive his love, to follow him, and to allow him to change our lives. That's why we're here, right? All of us. Well, I want to invite you into the sermon writing process for a moment. When I sit down to prepare a sermon, I'm always aware that there are an infinite amount of sermons in every passage because every preacher has a different perspective, which is wonderful, right? Which is why it's so great that Mike um, invites different people up here to share the pulpit and um, give a different take on, um, on the scripture. Well, the task of the preacher always is to listen deeply to the scripture and also listen deeply to what they know of the people that they are speaking to. So obviously in this case, it's me with Philippians 2 verses 1 through 11, listening for what God would have me say to you. The whole thing is a listening prayer, listening for the specific message God would have emerge from my heart. So here's the message I got for you today. In this passage, Paul gives some very specific instructions on how to live your life. But I'm not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't be selfish, you shouldn't be arrogant. I'm not even going to tell you that you should put the needs of the people next to you before your own. I'm not going to preach to you about all this because I think you already know this. You already know this. You are good church people. It's Sunday morning. It's a rainy day for us. This is a big storm. And you are here in church. You are not selfish. You are incredibly giving of your time and energy. I've seen you do it again and again when a need comes before the church, whether it's within or without. You do whatever you can to offer your support and help. I think you're pretty clear on how God calls us to live. What I do want to invite us to consider is Paul's encouragement in the second section of this passage to focus on the life, the witness of Christ. Kind of like when we focus on our identity as parents to children, when we focus on, on who we are in Christ, everything else becomes clear. So Paul begins in verse 5, let the same mind, this is the NRSV translation, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The same mind spent a lot of time thinking about what was the mind of Jesus like and what I kept coming back to is that the mind of Jesus was focused he was clear on who he was and he was clear on the path that God was calling him to walk which means that Jesus was not a people pleaser he did not lose himself in the expectations and agendas of the people around him I won't ask for a show of hands, but many of us struggle with this. I know I do. I want people to like me. I want people to accept me, approve of me, etc. But Jesus didn't have this issue, which is why we see in the Gospels that he sometimes left the crowds, left people who needed his healing, who needed his direction, his teaching. He sometimes didn't help, left them, and went away into the mountains to pray. He was focused first on God, being obedient to God's calling for him. Not only that, but we remember that the people of his day, they were expecting something very different. They were expecting the Jewish Messiah to be a military leader. And he wasn't. Surely Jesus disappointed people. And the reason I highlight this for us is because it's a reminder to us that we are not called to live for the expectations, agendas of the people that are in our circles. Not at all. We're called to follow the example of our Lord and follow God's particular path for us to be obedient, focused, first and foremost, on our loving God. Which 
as God reveals the particular path that we're called to, on, called to walk, it's probably going to be different than the one that the people next to us are called to do. The path is different for us all. My wise husband says from time to time, life's too short to live anybody else's life but your own. And what he means by that is we have to do the hard work and follow the example of Jesus and listen deeply for, our, for God's particular leading in our lives, which is not easy. It's a lot harder than following a list of do's and don'ts. We know it was difficult for Jesus to live out his calling. Remember the story of him before he went to the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he struggled deeply, asking of God, take this cup away from me. He struggled. And yet then he submitted his will to God, saying, yet not my will, but yours be done. I will share with you that it took me close to a decade to follow God's leading in my life to connect yoga to our Christian faith. It took me a long time to say yes to God's leading because this is a non-traditional form of ministry. And I wasn't so sure how it would be perceived by good church people. But the more I was encouraged by other people, the more I felt clear that I had to say yes to God's leading for me, because especially those of us who are church leaders, we need to be a part of helping the church change and grow and do church in new and creative and fresh ways. It's sometimes very difficult to follow the particular path that God lays out for us. Well, in this letter, Paul passionately persuades the Philippians to follow the example of Christ, who courageously and obediently and humbly followed God's leading for him. And as this hymn describes at the end, he used his power not to lord it over people, but to serve and to love. If you are in a stage of life that involves caregiving, you probably know all about this. You're practicing it every day. I tend to wonder if maybe all of us are in the caregiving stage at some point, just depending on when it is. It, for some, might be caring for young children, maybe for a spouse, a friend, or maybe for um, elderly parents. Well, years ago, my mother-in-law uh, began her journey with dementia, and it also began the journey for my father-in-law of then caring for her. And so for years, we watched him tirelessly care for her, um, which of course didn't get easier with time. It got harder as things advanced for her. And it was, it was unbelievable to watch him so tenderly, tenderly and selflessly care for his wife, who was not the person that she was years before. I used to say to him, you know, I write sermons, but you are living a sermon because his example was a very powerful witness of his faith and his very humbly quiet way of serving his wife. Some of you know all about that. Maybe you're walking that road right now or you have done so in the past. Sometimes we are crystal clear on the road that God is calling us to walk. The struggle is not knowing what it is, it's just leaning into God's strength to help us do it, to help us step up and live the life that we're called to live. This whole section is on imitating Christ's humility, putting his will, his will um, beneath God's will and following that. Well, last Thursday night, we started our five-week uh, book study on Waking Up White, Finding Myself in the Story of Race, book by Debbie, Debbie Irving. And about 30 of you crowded into room 11 with Vera Rimes and I. And I know many more of you uh, couldn't make that, that book study, but you're reading the book. I know the session's reading the book, and the staff is reading the book. And I gotta tell you, from my angle, this is a revealing of your humility to read, to be open to a book like this. Because talking about race can be very uncomfortable. It can be very vulnerable. 
And yet, reading a book like this, being open to a book like this, um, reveals a desire at some level to want to know what you don't know about race, about justice, about maybe what it's like to live in somebody else's skin that's different than your own. And hopefully together, as we do this, it'll help us learn to better live and love like Jesus. So as you think about your life today, what does it look for, like for you to follow in the way of Christ? Maybe you relate to his obedience, doing something that's very difficult, following a difficult path, and yet just leaning on the grace of God to help you do it. Maybe it's stepping out in faith to make some sort of a big life change in some way. Maybe it's call, being called to be self-sacrificial with your time, maybe your money, to care for um, another person, another group of people, maybe some cause that you feel passionate about. Maybe it's the call to humility. You know, forgiveness is a, a humble act, is it not? Uh, both receiving forgiveness from another person and also asking um, somebody to forgive us different for us all. Maybe today you're just being, feeling called to stay the course and to trust that you are loved and that there is still very much a purpose for your life. It's different for each one of us. Well, at the very end of the hymn, the, the words speak of how God exalted Christ to the highest place, which is why we gather here, right? To worship him together, to come to the table, which we'll do in a moment not only to celebrate the love of Christ that carries us into the next life, but the love of Christ that also companions us along this life, which is often so difficult. God so deeply loved us that God sent Christ into the world not only to live and die and be resurrected for us, but to companion us along this way. That's the good news. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for the witness of Christ, for the example of his love, for him modeling the way for us and what it means to give our lives away, what it looks like for us to follow you in obedience and faithfulness, especially when it's difficult. And so, Lord, we just pray now that as we come to the table, we pray that you would feed us body, mind, and soul. Would you feed us, gracious God, so that we would know your loving encouragement, your mercy, your strengths in our lives. Draw us ever closer to you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So may you go from here following our Lord's example, to love and serve and give your lives away as you follow the particular path that God has for you. May you listen deeply and have the courage and the desire to follow God's leading in your life, just as our Lord modeled for us. And may grace and peace be with you now and always.